Good morning. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Indiana State Library webinar on political activity at the library. I'm Sherry Harris, and I'm a longtime lawyer, but relatively new to library law. But library law overlaps with some other kinds of law. In terms of today's presentation, we'll be looking at election law and also First Amendment law, primarily. Um, I want to mention that I have Sylvia Watson here with me. She is general counsel for the Indiana State Library, and she is going to help me um, particularly marshal um, questions, keep track of the questions, since I won't be reading the chat box um, the entire time I'm presenting. Um, oh, I also want to mention that we will add, um, I'll send out a copy of the PowerPoint to you. I don't think that's going to be available for you to download unless I'm mistaken at the end of the program, but we will get it sent to you um, later on today or to everyone that um, yeah that is on this call. We'll send it out later today. Okay. Now we're now we're cooking with gas. Okay. <laughs> uh, maybe. Uh oh, somebody doesn't have sound. Okay, this is my disclaimer for my presentation. Uh oh. Um, and this is important. The goal of this webinar is to provide information about the law, but should not be construed as legal advice. If you have a legal problem, you should consult with your library's attorney. When you consult with your attorney, that conversation takes place within the context of a lawyer-client relationship. When I present this information to a group of people, that doesn't create a lawyer-client relationship, even if you ask a question and I attempt to answer it. I hope to provide you with some helpful information about how the law applies to libraries in general, but my role is not to advise you on the specific facts of your situation. So I will be discussing broad strokes and general guidelines. Please feel free to ask questions if you have during my presentation. I will probably save most of them until, um, until the end of my presentation, but um, please understand that I can't answer questions that ask for legal advice. Um, also, it's important for me to mention that my frame of reference for this presentation is Indiana law. <clears throat> and this uh, First Amendment law is just not an exact science. So uh, with that, we'll get started. Election season is here. I want you to hear that like winter is here, but it's just not winter yet. It's election season. Uh, Oops, and I got everything up. Okay. This is a little bit of a roadmap of where we are planning to go today. Um, my suggestion is that you always start by checking your library's policies and procedures, which should always be written policies and procedures. Um, today, we will talk about what activities are protected, what activities are prohibited, <clears throat> and what can and can't be regulated. Uh, specifically, if you want the if you want to regulate, regulate an activity that is constitutionally protected, such as First Amendment speech, you will need to meet a higher standard to show that the policy is legal. At the end, we'll go over a couple things that you really can't regulate, I think, and uh, hopefully have time to, oh, and yeah. So anyway, we have plenty to discuss, um, plenty to cover. So in talking about what we can regulate, we're going to start off with limits on you and your staff. Um, and again, uh, the, some of these may be in your policies and procedures if your board has already discussed this issue and come up with some uh, thoughts about how it wants to handle things. Um, the Hatch Act probably will apply in some way. And we also have state law and I didn't actually include the IAC rules, but um, the, the rules in the Indiana Administrative Code apply to uh, state employees only, um, but the statute applies to local government employees also. So that's that. Um, the first sort of 
section of the program is going to cover that. And then um, we're going to talk about limits on other people who may want to use the library's resources for campaign activities. That may be candidates, or it may be a political party, or a candidate's organizations are representing. Represent, sort of. Oh, yeah, I'm going to go over the Hatch Act in, in detail in just a minute. This is just your roadmap of where we're going. So um, the, uh, uh, the questions you're going to ask on the second part when you're looking at other people's activities is, is the First Amendment implicated? What type of forum are we talking about? And what type of test must the rest any restrictions um, meet in order uh, to satisfy um, the uh, constitutional requirements? Okay, so sources of, we're going to start with what activities are protected and sources of these protections, we're going to start with the First Amendment. Um, and uh, one second here, trying to get my notes together with the screen here. Oh, right. So just first on a reminder that the Bill of Rights only creates limits on what the government can do. It does not generally limit what individual citizens can do. The First Amendment specifically limits Congress's ability to pass certain laws. Does this apply to you? Well, not quite yet. Um, before we move to the part that makes it apply to you, um, I want to mention that you can see in the First Amendment there is no, the word library does not appear in that language. However, starting with the Third Circuit in Kramer versus Bureau of Police, circuit courts have found that the First Amendment includes a right to some level of access to a public library. And we'll get into that a little bit more shortly. So the First Amendment, how does it get, how do we get from this um, ban on Congress establishing laws to something that applies to us? We do that through the Fourth Amendment, Fourteenth Amendment which applies, which says that the state also cannot enforce a law that abridges the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. And the First Amendment is just that, a, um, a privilege of uh, the citizens of the United States. So that's what uh, federal law offers in the way of protection for First Amendment speech. Well, that plus a lot of cases <laughs> that interpret what that means. Um, but before we get to those cases, I want to talk about the Indiana Constitution. Um, so the Indiana Constitution is interesting because while the federal constitution added the Bill of Rights as an afterthought at the end um, of the constitution in the form of amending the, the United States Constitution after it, was, uh, it, after it was passed, well, historically it was in part to get it passed, but um, Indiana Constitution puts the Bill of Rights right up front in Article I of the Indiana State Constitution. Um, but you can see this is Section 9. Um, the uh, no law shall be passed restraining the free interchange of thought or opinion or restricting the right to speak, write, or print freely on any subject, whatever. But for the abuse of that right, every person shall be responsible. Um, so there are 39 sections to the Indiana Bill of Rights. Um, this means that those 39 sections are obviously not identical to the 10 amendments that make up the U.S. Bill of Rights. Uh, in the U.S. Constitution, the First Amendment covers both religious freedom and freedom of speech in one kind of longish sentence. But in the Indiana Constitution, there are seven sections on religious freedom that precede this Section uh, 9, which gets to the... Um, uh, the uh, the first mention of freedom of speech. So um, I also thought it was, might be a, just an interesting note to share that the most recent provision in Indiana's Bill of Rights contains a right to hunt fish and harvest wildlife. There are some limitations on that right, but it's still kind of an interesting thing to have in the Bill of Rights, I think. Okay, and then there's another provision that also addresses some of what we're going to be talking about what, well, some of what the First Amendment covers, which is that in Section 31 the, of the Indiana Bill of Rights, 
is a uh, right to assemble in a peaceable manner. So uh, that's something to keep in mind um, as far as the right of assembly goes. Okay. So what activities are restricted and what are the source of restrictions on you and your staff? Uh, in this section, we're going to look at um, restrictions on political activity that apply to you and your staff. And, oh, mm -hmm. sorry, I'm in a little trouble with my cursor here, but here we go. Ah, now we're going to talk about the specifics of the Hatch Act. Um, this quote that I'm starting with here presents a pretty good sum summary judgment, as good, a sub as good of a summary, not summary judgment, <laughs> that's something altogether different, uh, a, a general summary of the purpose of the Hatch Act. Um, you can, by the way, contact the Office of Special Counsel for advisory opinions on whether and how the Hatch Act applies to you. Uh, they offer, a, they issue advisory opinions as well as investigating and prosecuting violations. We're going to have, I'm going to go into more detail here on what the Hatch Act does and doesn't allow. Um, but just this is the the sort of I had a I had a page on here on the history of the Hatch Act, and I thought that's too much detail. You probably don't need that. I'll just give you a summary on the purpose of it, which was to keep partisan politics from getting to uh, from um, uh, influencing government institutions too much, and also to protect public servants from perceived pressure from political parties. And one of his, in the historical example I'll give of that is there was a time in Indiana that state employees were expected to join the 2% club in which the 2% um, of their paycheck would be donated before they got the paycheck to political parties. That was the exact sort of thing that the Hatch Act was designed to prevent, I believe. Um, although I will say that 2%, uh, the ability to donate 2% through your paycheck continued well after the Hatch Act was adopted. So there you go. Okay. Um, the Hatch Act applies to employees of most federal agencies and to state and local government employees who perform work duties in relation to activities funded in whole or in part by federal loans or grants. So the question here is, have you received any list of money? <laughs> because if you have, then your staff is probably covered by the Hatch Act. Um, if you have a position that is entirely funded by a uh, grant or, um, or uh, federal funds, then you, that, that may, create an even higher standard of how the Hatch Act applies. But for the most part, most employees are prohibited from engaging in political activity while at work or, or while on duty. And those political activities include things like wearing or displaying political, a partisan political pins or stickers. Um, you can't solicit funds during work time or on work property uh, or from those who do business with your agency or from any of your work subordinates. And you can't use um, your title at your work or your affiliation with, your, with the library in any solicitations that you may make to people on your own time. So um, you also are not supposed to attend any political rallies during your work hours. So if there is a political rally on work hours, you want to either take that day off and attend on your own time rather than your employer's time or um, you know, talk with your employer about specifically limiting your hours that you are working on that day. Um, so the idea is to have a clean break between what you can and can't do at work. And um, I just want to mention this uh, idea of um, while at work or while on duty and how uh, fitting that language is now that a lot of us have been doing a lot of our work from home, in which case we are not at work, but we are on duty. So it picks up uh, it picks up the um, work from home uh, expansion that most of us have experienced this year uh, in a way that um, 
doesn't doesn't get you out of having to comply. Let's put it that way. Sure. Yes. Oh, you know what? Um, actually, I'm going to talk about that uh, a little bit later when I talk about if you're a polling place and the activities that you can and can't have in the um, workplace, because I think our state law does a better job of narrowing what's meant by that than the Federal Hatch Act does, or at least as far as I got through the Federal Hatch Act. So, um, <clears throat> uh, Right, so you're correct. That, uh, so the question was, um, it specifically says partisan political pins. What about nonpartisan pins that may be political or other adornments? Other adornments, I think, are definitely included in that. Um, so, for example, I think a T-shirt or a hat would be included in that. But, um, but, I, but specifically... Uh, there's a distinction between partisan political pins and other types of political pins, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. And we are going to talk definitely about polling places. Okay. <clears throat> so where am I? Uh, let's see. Yes. Uh, one thing that the statute doesn't specify is it doesn't specify masks, but I would say that in the current environment where a lot of us are required to wear masks at work, that wearing a mask that has partisan political sentiment on it should probably not be done while you're at work. Um, okay. Um, ha the Hatch Act was recent, fair, it was eight years ago, the Hatch Act was modernized and it changed the Hatch Act to allow most state and local government employees the, the option of running for a partisan political office with an exception that the employee's position, um, uh, this doesn't apply if the employee's position is completely financed by federal funds. Also, in Indiana, there's a limit on this that the work that you do has to be for a different unit of government than the position you're running for. So if you work for city council, you can run for um, a county position um, or a local, like a, or a, a um, township trustee kind of position. You can't work for the township trustee and also run for township trustee. And if if you do that, if you if you're trying to hold a position, work position that is with the same unit as the um, office that you're running for, then if you win that election as of the date that you start in that position, it's considered a your work is considered terminated. Your non-elective elected position is considered terminated or it's treated like a resignation. Um, okay. <laughs> there are a number of things that employees can still do on their own time, provided it's not in an official capacity as a public employee under the Hatch Act. So just, uh, you know, employees can register to vote, can vote, can assist in voter registration drives, um, can sign and circulate nominating petitions, can even hold office in a political party or political club. Um, as an individual, you are still entitled to express your opinions about candidates and issues, campaign for or against candidates in partisan elections, provided you're not using your position as uh, for influence in your um, activities. Uh, this is all on your own time and just on your name and not on your title, your work title. Um, you can make campaign speeches, distribute campaign literature, volunteer on a campaign, contribute money to political organizations, attend political fundraisers, be active at a political rally or meeting, campaign for or against referendum questions. So these are all things that you can do on your own time. And we're going to talk about how important that on your own time is 
in this slide, do not use government property. <laughs> this is an, in the, oh, yeah, okay. Um, so do not use, um, turn, turning to the Indiana Code now, uh, this is a provision on the use of government property. And um, I'm gonna share a couple of the definitions for what this is, but it basically says you can't use the property of your, gov your employer, the government, to solicit a contribution, advocate the election or defeat of a candidate or public question or distribute campaign materials. And there is a penalty for that. Um, and the penalty goes up if you've already been convicted of this. Um, so in, the, in this code site, code section, government employee is defined to include state or political subdivision employee. So that specifically imply, applies to uh, state employees and to um, political subdivision employees. So probably everyone on this call. Um, and property includes equipment, goods, mail, and messaging systems and money. So the moral of the story is don't engage in political activity during work hours or at work or when you're on duty. So that's a big no-no. Uh, yeah, we are going to talk. We're going to. Yeah, I see that there's a question about what is considered partisan political in this context, and I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to drill down on that um, when we talk about um, what you what you can't what when we talk about the term electioneering and what you can and can't do if you at a polling place because that's going to talk about that. Um, also. Um, the question about bumper stickers on staff cars, I will say that in, uh, in Indiana code, I believe it's specific to, um, get to cars that are owned by the government employer. So here at the state, if for some reason I was allowed to drive a car from the state motor pool, which doesn't hardly exist anymore, I, you can't put a bumper sticker on that. Um, I don't think that it's prohibited to put one on your car, your own car, even though you're parking in a in a your employer's government parking lot. Um, so then this next question about is it illegal to do this during your lunch hour and using public computers? And you don't want to use a public computer to do this at any time. That's the at work part. So even if it's on the weekend, uh, oh, using public computers. So if you mean uh, your library computer, you don't want to use a library computer, whether it's intended for the pub for public use or for your individual work use. You don't want to use that to do campaign activities because then, because that's using the resources of your government employer. That would definitely count as using the resources sources of your government employer. If you live right next door to the library and you can run home on your lunch hour and do that from your home computer, uh, that would be okay to do at your lunch hour. So it's, we're gonna get really specific about the details of these things. And you'll find when we get into the Supreme Court cases that um, they don't always, agree with the same, they don't always provide the same logic and uh, that makes it a little bit more confusing. Um, but, okay, so now we're getting ready to, we're, to talk about the polling place issues and that will answer a number of the questions that I've been putting off so far. A library that's used as a polling place is subject to even more regulations. Um, a person who knowingly does electioneering, and I'm gonna share the definition of that on the next slide, on election day within the polls or the shoot, and I've got the definition of that on the next slide too, commits um, a class A misdemeanor. Um, and this is relevant here because um, according to a recent ILF poll, 19% of libraries in Indiana serve as either polling locations or vote centers. 
So that means it applies to nearly one in five of you. And um, if your library is a vote center, you should probably read the term on election day to mean on any day the vote center is open for voting. Uh, so if you're an early voting site, that's gonna be a lot longer period of time that this will apply than just election day. Um, okay, so definitions. Polling place terms, electioneering. Um, includes expressing approval or disapproval of any public question in any manner reasonably expected to convey that support or opposition to another individual. Wearing or displaying an article of clothing, sign, button, or placard that, and now these are the specifics of what Indiana law election law requires, states the name of any political party or includes the name, picture, photograph, or other likeness of any currently elected federal, state, county, or local official. And then the shoot, I, you probably know what the shoot is. It's the, a measurement of 50 feet from the entrance to the polls in which there can't be any electioneering. So it's the place, it's the, the place where nobody puts signs outside of the poll and you have to go outside of that area to put the signs. Um, okay, so, um, there was a fairly recent U.S. Supreme Court case in, um, in uh, boy, okay, I see more questions, but I'm going to go forward with the information I have to present first. The polling place, oh, fairly recent Supreme Court case. In 2018, um, the court overturned Minnesota's parallel statute to this but Minnesota statute was worded differently than ours, and it was more vague, and then the Minnesota State Elections Board distributed information to help election judges interpret the statute that further complicated the question. And because of that, the Supreme Court said, it's even though there is a legitimate reason to have limits on political speech inside the polling area. This particular statute was too broad because it was too confusing to apply. Um, their statute did not define political, but prohibited a person from wearing a political badge, button, or insignia in a polling place. And that's where you, uh, our statute is much more specific in that. It's limited to a political party and a, the name or picture or photograph of an elected official. But in the, um, in the Minnesota Voters Alliance versus Mansky, the court determined that the statute would be unevenly applied by different election judges trying to determine which of the following things would be allowed into the polling place or turned away from the polling place. And as examples, they gave a button or t-shirt that says vote. Um, what about somebody wearing a t-shirt or button that says hashtag me too? Or somebody wearing an NR NRA t-shirt or cap or paraphernalia or even an AARP t-shirt cap paraphernalia, ACLU t-shirt cap paraphernalia. And the concern was because political wasn't defined, it was not defined as partisan there, it wasn't defined as bearing information about a candidate, that really a wide number of logos could fall into that um, kind of catch-all of political, um, you know, it, and, and one example is it doesn't, it doesn't indicate, you know, whether someone could go to the polls wearing a MAGA cap or not. But, um, so that's where the lines get drawn is a statute that's so broad that you can't tell whether or no whether or not any reference to political issues that might be that maybe a candidate has taken a position on um, if you can't tell whether those things can get into the polls or not then you don't have a good statute and the courts will strike it down and the court did in minnesota um, so Minnesota's statute was presumably significantly broader than a lot of other polling place statutes. Um, and one example they gave was 
in oral argument, they asked if somebody wearing the language of the Second Amendment on a T-shirt could get into the polls. The, um, the state said no, they couldn't. And then they said, what about the First Amendment? And they said, yes, they could. So that's how the dividing of lines can get kind of preposterous if, if you don't narrow down what is meant by political. Our, st our statute doesn't have to define political because it doesn't use the term political. Um, I don't want to go back on that right now. Okay. Um, so hopefully that answers some of your questions about um, where we draw lines on defining political for purposes of electioneering. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about what the what First Amendment cases say about limiting speech. Um, and this is where we'll start talking about what other people can and can't do on libraries' property. Um, and let's see. Okay. Yeah, I just want to mention that this is not um, an exact science by any means, and that sometimes the court, there are uh, members of the court and observers of the court who don't like this forum analysis, and there are uh, people who apply it um, exactly as it's been applied before, and then there are people who just make little changes in how they apply it, and that confuses things. But the questions that are asked in cases where it's a question of whether or not you can limit political speech, the, um, which is a, which just pr protected speech under the First Amendment, what type of forum is the public property? What is the primary purpose of the property? Do the objective characteristics of the property suggest expressive content? And what test will be applied if to determine whether or not the um, uh, restrictions are constitutional. So a couple of qualifications that I want to extend here. Most of the cases talk about the rights of religious groups to use a library's meeting room. Uh, I haven't found any cases that specifically talk about the right of political groups to do the same. Um, and there was a period of time, it seems, when libraries thought that the separation of church and state required them to have policies saying that religious groups could not use their meeting rooms or could not use them for religious services, um, and often also exempted, uh, said that political parties can't use them either for meetings. Um, and the court has indicated that at least as far as the religious groups go, it's not acceptable to restrict them from meeting in your meeting room. Um, and theoretically, the analysis should be similar for political activities, except that I have noticed that in dicta, meaning when the case was, the issue was not before them, courts have commented that restriction on partisan activities still leaves open a lot of alternate channels for political communication. So maybe that's not exactly the same as um, the religious cases. Um, at any rate, at this point, you may be starting to understand that the questions we started out with are not going to have simple yes and no answers. <laughs> and I'll understand if you want a refund on your registration for this program. So uh, First Amendment cases divide um, the world into the, the divide public property, government property, into three types of fora, which is just the plural for forum. I believe I have that right. Um, traditional public forum. Uh, examples are streets and parks, and these are considered exactly the place people would go to if they want to talk about something that's going on in the government. So the, the court generally considers the purpose of streets and parks to be for the free exchange of ideas. Um, you have a designated or limited public forum, and some cases divine, de, define those two things differently or consider limited a subset of designated public forum. But 
other cases use those two words interchangeably. So I'm not even going to get into the specifics of that yet at this point in this program because it goes a little bit far. Um, but examples would be a public library is pretty much routinely considered a designated public forum. Um, also, a college campus is generally considered a limited public forum. The purpose of those places are to be places of learning um, and the, um, um, well, I forgot what I was going to say, but I'm going to keep going. The third thing, the third type is a non-public forum, and examples of that would be military installations or prisons, and there the purpose is to focus on security, not learning or exchange of ideas. Um, so the First Amendment case law recognizes these three types of fora, um, and the Third Circuit described where libraries fit into this scheme in Kramer versus Bureau of Police, saying, it is clear to us that a public library, albeit the quintessential locus for the exercise of the right to receive information and ideas, is sufficiently dissimilar to a public park, sidewalk, or street, that it cannot reasonably be deemed to constitute a traditional public forum. Obviously, a library patron cannot be permitted to engage in most traditional First Amendment activities in the library, such as giving speeches or engaging in other conduct that would disrupt the quiet and peaceful library environment. So um, that kind of makes as clear as things get in First Amendment law um, it clear that a public library is in the middle zone there, the second type of fora. So traditionally, you don't go to the public library to make speeches. However, if you have a meeting room or even, I mean, some of this depends on the specifics of the layout, size, and facilities of your library. If you have a, an auditorium that you, is only used for library events, then that auditorium has not been opened uh, as a designated public forum because it's just for the library's use. But if you have an auditorium that is where people are allowed to do all kinds of things, sing and dance and make speeches, then you're going to have to go through this analysis of, you know, that the state has opened up that property, has made a ch choice to open up that property um, as a public forum. Also, just to make things a little extra confusing, the court has said that different parts of a public building may be different types of fora. So the lobby of a building may be treated differently than an auditorium or a meeting room. Okay. Um, moving forward. Uh, so now each of those three, for, three types of fora, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail of how those... Um, play out, starting with the traditional public forum, which is streets and parks. Um, so for traditional public forum, uh, the, uh, the court looks at the historical role of the location. And also, by the way, usually sidewalks fall into this category, but not always. So we'll talk about the sidewalk distinctions in just a little bit. But um, in places that are designed for the free exchange of ideas, the highest scrutiny is given to placing restrictions on free speech. Um, and in these places, you aren't allowed to make a restriction that is based on the viewpoint of the person who wishes to um, express themselves. Um, you may... Uh, Okay, so for content-based exclusion, it has to be necessary to serve a compelling state interest and be narrowly drawn to achieve that end. For content-neutral restrictions, such as time, place, and manner, um, that such a restriction is allowed provided it's narrowly tailored to serve a significant state interest and leave open ample alternative channels of communication. So that's your most uh, public of public fora. The next one is the designated or limited public forum. And um, so here, 
the government has made an act has taken an act, has taken action to open the public place for expressive activity. And the main distinction between the first category and this category is that and this is where libraries fall, is that once you've opened the location for expressive activity, you are not forced to continue to keep it open. You can change your mind, you can close, start over, close it down, and, um, and you're, you're allowed to do that, but as long as it's open for uh, public expression, this test is the exact same as a traditional public fora which is that restrictions are subject to strict scrutiny, content-based uh, exclusions have to be necessary to serve a compelling state interest and be narrowly drawn. Content neutral restrictions, once again, have to be narrowly tailored to serve a significant state interest and leave open ample uh, alternative channels of communication. And then finally is the non-public forum. Um, and it is okay for the government to close these non-public forum facilities to everyone except for the people who are supposed to be there. The standard is reasonableness. Uh, the government has much more flexibility to craft rules limiting speech in a non-public forum. In Greer v. Spock, a case involving Fort Dix, the U.S. Supreme Court held that it was reasonable to restrict all political activity. No speeches or demonstrations are allowed at the fort, and distribution of literature requires prior approval. The court upheld or allowed these provision, these restrictions. Um, and a polling place on election day has also been held to be a non-public forum. So it doesn't mean you can, you can restrict all po political speech there necessarily, mm -hmm. but your, any political speech that you try to restrict, there has to be, uh, it has to be reasonable. And the problem with the case that we talked about a little bit earlier from Minnesota is that the restriction itself wasn't reasonable. Not that they were trying to restrict it. We restrict it here, and our statute does it presumably in a reasonable way, but um, uh, an unreasonable statute doesn't necessarily pass that test, of, or wouldn't pass that test of reasonable. So. Now we're going to try and apply some of these um, analyses to some sample situations. Um, and I go back again to what does your public pol library public policy say when you get any of these types of questions? Do you already have a library um, policy that addresses this? Look at that first, because your library you probably have a meeting room policy. And hopefully you had your um, library attorney vetted before you your board adopted it, but it may answer a number of these questions for you already. Um, also, uh, yeah, I already mentioned that the answers may de vary depending on location and size and layout. Um, so the first question is meeting rooms. Let me make sure I have the right. Okay, um, can a candidate use your meeting room for a meet and greet? And that question has, has come around this year already because several of you have been contacted about this, I believe. And basically, um, based on these different cases that don't ask that exact question, but ask similar questions, um, yes, if the candidate's activity is confined to the meeting room and doesn't spill out into the library, and the meeting room is made available to other candidates on the same terms, um, then, uh, uh, the, then the last thing is that it should be clear that the library is not sponsoring this activity unless it's a forum with all candidates invited. Um, can the library sponsor a candidate forum? Uh, yes, if all candidates are invited. Also, if you have questions about your meeting room policy, uh, you can contact the ALA's Office of Intellectual Freedom for advice on meeting room policies. Okay, more examples. Can a person leaflet in the following places? The library, the lobby, on sidewalks in front of the lobby, or in the parking lot? 
and can a candidate put signs up on library property? Okay, so let me make sure I've got my right page here. Okay, we're gonna these each of these areas, library, lobby, sidewalk, parking lot, have to be analyzed under the forum analysis. What type of forum is it? And they aren't necessarily all the same. So in the library. Um, there are a couple of issues you would look at, but it would not be unreasonable, I don't think, to say that it would probably be reason, unreasonably disruptive to the activities that make up the primary purpose of a library and to patrons who also have a First Amendment right to use the library in the way that it's intended. So where you've got a conflict of different individuals' First Amendment rights, um, you get a little bit different analysis than when it's just a question of one person's First Amendment rights being challenged. So um, can a person leaflet in the library? I, I think there's a good argument for saying, no, it would be too disruptive. Um, but I can't guarantee you that's gonna be a successful court case. I just think there's a good argument for that. Um, in the lobby, Lobbies are often treated differently. Um, it's considered a more refined place that sets the tone for the whole building. Some lobbies have artwork, some lobbies have, uh, you know, um, try to set a tone of being an elegant place or being a um, practical place. And so depending on how your lobby is used and treated, um, the lobby might not be the best place to have that activity. Um, you might want to direct it to the meeting, to a meeting room. Although if what the, the activity they want to do is leafleting, probably a meeting room isn't a helpful place to do that, but that's a different activity. Anyway, on the sidewalk, that depends. A sidewalk is generally considered a traditional public forum. However, you can imagine, if you can imagine two different scenarios and how they might come out differently, um, the first scenario, a library is right on a town square and the sidewalk in front of the library also runs all the way around the town square. In that situation, it sounds like a traditional public forum. But if the library has its own parking lot that's used only by patrons and staff, and I'm picturing here my the Nora Library in Indianapolis because that's the library I used to study at when I was in high school, um, where the uh, parking lots used only by patrons and staff and the sidewalk only goes between the parking lot and the library. You can't get anywhere else on that sidewalk. That's less public forum like and could lose the characteristic of being seen as a public thoroughfare, which is part of the reason that the um, uh, sidewalk all, that goes all the way around the town square, including in front of the library, is considered a traditional public forum. So. Um, what do, oh, there's a split on this uh, between, um, no, sidewalks, I'm sorry, I got jumped ahead to here. Okay, um, so the in Coquinda, the court held that the sidewalk in front of a post office is a non-public forum and that regulation only needs to be reasonable. So that's where, you know, you run the range depending on the specific details of finding that the sidewalk is either a traditional public forum, the most um, open place for First Amendment speech and the most restrictive um, place for regulating public speech, all the way to a non-public forum, which is the least available for public speech and the most flexible about adopting regulations that may infringe on that. Um, Parking lots are very similar, and it depends on whether they're used only by staff and patrons or shared with other organizations in the area. Plus, there's a split in the districts in circuit courts across the country. The Seventh Circuit, which is we are in the Seventh Circuit, and therefore it would be considered um, authority for us, uh, Oh, has said that where um, a prohibition on speech includes a parking lot, the um, regulation was deemed to not be narrowly tailored and failed to provide an alternative method of communication. So the Seventh Circuit does not favor 
restricting activities in the parking lot, political activities in the parking lot. The Seventh Circuit sees that as a public space. Um, and yet the Ninth Circuit says, well, the Ninth Circuit says a parking lot is a public forum. And the Second Circuit says a parking lot adjacent to a courthouse is not a public forum. Um, so <laughs> you have to work with the facts you have. And it's likely that the, tr the result you should come to is not necessarily going to be um, uh, monolithic. It's not going to be entirely clear whether you have the on the right side of this or not. Um, um, I didn't put outdoor space in that slide, but the question I would ask about outdoor space is, is it park-like? If so, you probably want to treat it the way the courts have treated parks, which is traditional public forum. Um, signs, if a poll, if again, if you're a polling place, you need to follow the polling place requirements. Um, but also, uh, there was an eight, 1984 U.S. Supreme Court opinion that said that government can prohibit posting signs on public property at any time to avoid visual clutter. So you probably won't get in trouble by refusing to let people post signs of any kind in at any time at your in your um, library. Okay, I think I got through everything, and that means I do have some time left for questions, uh, depending on how challenging they are. Okay. Okay. The ones with the check marks you've already covered. Okay. Great. Okay. Engaging in political. Okay, I'm now I'm going to look at some of the questions you've been asking in the chat that I haven't quite uh, caught up with. Engaging in political activity using your own device, but the library's computers. No, using, but, using your own device, the library's Wi-Fi. But the library's Wi-Fi. You know, using the library's Wi-Fi while you're at work, I would say you don't want to engage in political activity. Um, I think even on your phone, even um, you know, updating your status for various um, social media, you may be able to do that on your break on your phone on the library's Wi-Fi until you hit like on a political candidate and then you've used government resources for political expression. Um, but I mean, I, I'm not saying I have a case that says that. I'm just saying that's how I would look at that. Um, what are recognized political party names? <coughs> well, the Tea Party is kind of litigious, so I think you want to keep in mind the fact that if you're going to restrict them, they might sue you. Um, obviously, Republican and Democrat, but I think when I say that you have to invite all candidates, I think you have to go beyond the two parties and see, is there a libertarian candidate? Is there a green candidate? Is there an independent candidate? Um, and you may have to do some research to find that out. Um, so... <clears throat> But and the NRA, although they have political positions, I would say is not a political party. They don't actually, well, they may fund some candidates, but they don't actually run their own candidates as a separate party. Um, the shoot, is it 50 feet from the front door of the building or from the room? So I think it depends on the building and how far it is from the front door to the room to begin with. Um, and if it's 50 feet from the front door to the room where the polling is, then that could be the chute, and the chute could pretty much start at the exterior door, I believe. I'm not positive about this, actually, even though I've looked it up a little bit. Um, what I do know, and I did put in the, um, the materials, is that um, if you're, there's a situation where the door... So some places, like uh, school, where you enter the gym and the gym is the polling place, if that door to enter the gym, the polling place, is less than 50 feet from the property line, then the way you figure out what the shoot is is based on um, half of the distance from the door to the property line is the shoot, even though that's less than 50 feet. Um, and... The idea of the shoot is to give people a place where they can just be on their way to vote before they hit the actual polls so that you're not kind of harassing them all the way up to the very last possible second. So um, that's um, 
uh, my thought about that. I, I, I think actually, I'll tell you what, I would contact the election board first for more information about that. There are election, um, uh, there are election manuals on the election board's website that probably answer this pretty well, but if not, you can call the state election board and they could answer it easily. Probably you could even call your local election board. Um, can staff talk to each other or to patrons about political to topics or should they walk away? Well, talking about political topics is one thing. I think that you that a staff member could express a reaction to current events, which may be considered political topics, without endorsing one candidate or another candidate or without um, stating that they're opposed to one candidate or another candidate. I think that they should walk away if they're being asked specifically about who they're going to vote for, or they could say, you know, I, I really can't talk about that at work. Um, uh, so hopefully that gives you some idea on that. Um, how could expressive activity, regardless of government intent, apply to places deemed designated or limited? I'm not sure what that question is asking, so I'm going to invite you to uh, email me with more details on that. And is is that the end? Or okay, well, that's not the end. Okay, I don't think I got to everything, but hopefully I got to most of it. And now uh, I, the um, Lisa is going to put up the LEU certificate that you can download. Um, <laughs> The, okay, okay, this is a really fair uh, statement. Somebody says any party might sue, not just the Tea Party. That is absolutely true. And in fact, if you treat one candidate different than another candidate, um, the way that the authorities will find out and potentially um, find you in violation of the Hatch Act or Code uh, or Indiana Code site is that the candidate that was not given the same benefits as the candidate that was treated well is going to tell them. So it's not like you can keep those things um, quiet. Oh boy, our face coverings required to vote. Um, <laughs> I yeah I um, you know I think that they are required, but that doesn't necessarily mean that requirement will be strictly enforced because I don't think you can turn away a voter for not having one, even if you are requiring them. Um, oh, huh. Um, let's see. Time. We're out of time. You know. Your questions have been great. If I didn't answer your question, um, please feel free and contact me. I can try and look through the chat to see if there are questions I missed and send something out with those answers. But um, I just, um, I think I got to, to most of them and hopefully gave answers that seemed reasonable. So um, hopefully you have downloaded your uh, uh, certificate here and put your name in it and keep it in your LEU file. And <laughs> thank you so much for your interest in this topic and for everything that you do during the political season to support general voter registration, general uh, voter education, all the things that you are allowed to do and do so well. And with that, I will conclude this presentation.